all take our seats. Can you say to the person beside you, you are so blessed by God. Remember, He chose you before He created the world according to Ephesians 1.3. He chose you before He created the world so that you will be reconciled to Him through the sacrifice of Jesus. And Jesus saw you worth dying for even though we tore His heart apart because of our sins. Amen? No greater love than this than He laid down His life for His friends. Amen? You are not even His friends. We were His enemies. That's why Romans 5 says, really would a man give his life, you know, for somebody who is evil, but maybe can give his life for a good person. The most outstanding thing, Romans 5.8 reminds us, 5.8, God demonstrates His love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, rebels, unworthy, Christ died for us. Amen? God affirmed your worth by His grace so that you will affirm His worth through worship. And worship is more than just singing. Worship is an attitude and a way of life. That you live your life every day to honor God. And everything that you think, and everything that you say, and everything you have to do, you do it because you want to honor God because He deserves it all. Amen? That's why when you know what God has done for you in Christ, and you know to whom you belong, we'll be broken in our conscience to think that we are still going to live for ourselves. Because all our lives before we came to Christ, we've been living for ourselves. And that broke the heart of God. Now we spend the rest of our life, as Paul writes in his epistle, no longer for our own desires. We spend the rest of our life doing His will because we want to honor Him. Amen? Young people, you just don't know how much Jesus loves you. And His desire is for you to love Him back because He deserves it. Amen? Okay? Today, we're going to talk about an important truth of the Scriptures so that all of us will know where this church stands in this particular doctrinal area. We're going to talk about the gifts of the Spirit, but not about the gifts themselves, but in answer to the question, when does the gifts of the, do the gifts of the Spirit cease to operate? I'd like to invite you today to read the Scriptures with me to provide the context of our understanding and discussion so you will understand how important the gifts of the Spirit are to God and to Jesus, the head of the church, and why each one of us should be responsible enough to exercise those gifts because Jesus wants to touch the world through you, through those gifts. He wants to minister to people through you to those gifts, and that is the way that He has chosen by which you will serve Him. We do not choose how we serve God. It is God who chooses how He wants you to serve Him. Amen? Can you say that to the person beside you? You cannot choose how you're going to serve God. It is God who chooses how you will serve Him. Because each one of us must play an important role in the bigger picture of God's work in the world. Each of us each one of us has his own unique assignment. And you need to focus on that assignment instead of trying to do the work of another's or trying to imitate the work of another's because that is not for you. Find out what God wants you to do and be faithful to it. Amen? That is how God wants you to serve him. So let's take a look first at defining terms so that we understand when I use this term, you understand what we're talking about. So the first thing I want us to talk about are two important views regarding how long the gifts of the Spirit operate. So the non-cessationist view, can I say that? The non-cessationist view. This is the belief that all the gifts, all without exemption, all the gifts of the Spirit listed in the New Testament, particularly 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans 12, will continue to manifest in the church until the second coming of Christ, all of them. Okay? That's the non-cessationist view. The opposing view is the cessationist view, which developed later on in the church around fourth, the 4th century AD. But it's never, it was never held 
in the earliest years of the apostolic church. The Sassanians view the belief that certain gifts, particularly miracles, healing, prophecy, and tongues, have already ceased to operate. And after the New Testament canon, the collection of inspired authoritative writings we now call our New Testament, was completed in the 4th century AD. And we will take a look at how they came to this understanding and how this understanding actually is not in line with the actual thread of thought that Paul was pursuing from chapter 12, 13, and 14. This is found in chapter 13. Okay? And we'll take a look at where the mind of Paul is leading us when he's expounding on the gifts of the Spirit. So we understand what did Paul mean. Remember, he wrote this under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Let's take a look at uh, the next slide. So let's read the scriptures. Very famous scriptures, 1 Corinthians 13. So can we read this together? Tongues of men and of angels, but have not love. I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. And before we move to the next part of this chapter, the next part explains what love is based on the model of Christ. But we're going to skip that. We'll go straight to the next part, which talks about how long do these gifts operate. Okay? But let me help you understand that this is part of a flow of argument or explanation that Paul started in chapter 12. If you understand chapter 13, to understand chapter 13, you have to understand what he was talking about in the preceding chapter and in the following chapter and able to trace his thread of thought. You understand this, okay? So we're taking a look at the middle. We're now in the middle and we will backtrack in a while on what he said in the preceding chapter. So we see the context where he's going. So he's saying, he's talking about these key gifts because in the list of the preceding chapter on the gifts of the Spirit, there are more gifts than we find here. These are just some of the gifts listed. But they represent the gifts that the Greeks valued so much. You know, the Greek shipping people, what are they known for? They're known for three important things. Their philosophies, Socrates, Aristotle, Plato, all of them are Greek philosophers. They're named, known for their knowledge. What else? They're also known, known for their oracles. Very famous in Greece, even in the time of Paul, are the oracles of Delphi, where they have this. An oracle means either a prophetess or a prophecy. Okay? Say that with me. The, a prophet, a prophetess, or a prophecy. That's the meaning of oracle, depending on the context. Okay? So when we say oracle, it can mean a person who receives revelation from their God about future things. And then they give these utterances or messages with pay. You have to pay for them. And the Greeks don't care how much it costs because they want oracles. So that is where oracle means the prophecy itself. So very famous in ancient Greece was the famous oracle of uh, Delphi, whose name was Pythia, because she, this priestess was the priestess of the god Apollo. And people believe that when she prophesied, she was speaking from the god Apollo. And the word Pythia is actually not her real name, but it is a name she attached to herself because she was possessed by the god Python. The god Python in Greek mythology is the god of divination. The God who tells you what the future is like. In fact, in Acts chapter 16, verse 16, when Paul was ministering in the, the city of Philippi, they encountered this woman, this slave girl, who had the gift of predicting the future. And Acts 16, 16 says that she had the spirit of Python in the Greek language. In the English translation, it is translated, she had the spirit by which she predicted the future. That's a long translation just for three words, actually, uh, two words in the Greek. She had the spirit of Python because Python is the god of fortune telling, the god who reveals the future. And that is the name of that oracle in Delphi. And the other famous oracle is the oracle in Dodona whose name was Dione in the city of 
Eripos, okay, in ancient Greece, also famous for the where the oracles of uh, Erythea, uh, Kome, and another one, okay. Uh, you have to pardon me for my memory lapses. <laughs> another one, but the most famous of all prophetic oracles in Greece was that of Delphi, Pythia. You understand that? That's why. That name occurs in the New Testament in Acts chapter 16, verse 16. So they were well known for their oracles. Many people from different nations would go to Greece just to consult these oracles or prophetesses. That's why prophecy was very, very high valued in, in the, among the Greeks. And thirdly, they were also known for their eloquence. The greatest orators were Greeks. Demosthenes the great orator. That's why the Greeks valued not only knowledge, not only the ability to see the fear, they also valued speaking ability. They valued that so much. They gave high value to people who are eloquent. Okay, that's why Paul, when he wrote to Corinthians, I did not come to you with the eloquence of men, but I came to you by the power of the Holy Spirit. So your, your faith will not rest on Human ability, but on the Spirit of God. You understand that? Because that's what the Greeks valued. And Paul knew exactly the mind of these Corinthian Christians who were Greeks. And that's why of all the gifts of the Spirit, he focused on these because these were of high value to them. Greeks were also known for their generosity. Very well known. And they have the faith that gave them courage to face even the worst enemies. Remember the story of the Spartans? In that famous pass, remember the movie 300? Okay, what was that place again where they fought against the Persians and they were able to resist the Persians? With only 300 Spartan Greek soldiers resisted an entire mammoth army of the Persians and prevented them from entering through that particular narrow path towards Greece. You understand that? They are known for their bravery because they believe they can conquer anything. This is high value to the Greeks. And the reason why Paul points out these gifts of all the gifts he listed in the preceding chapters because these were high value gifts to the Greeks, his audience. Do you understand this? But it doesn't mean these are the only gifts. Amen? But yet he was trying to say because the Corinthian church was a church divided, divided for so many reasons. They were divided in their loyalties to certain, you know, preachers. I am Apollo, I am of Cephas, the original, the Simon Peter. I am of Apollos, very eloquent preacher. So they had loyalties towards what they call ministers or theologians. Remember this, the word of God is saying to us in Corinthians, all of these men, Paul would say, they all belong to you. Because you belong to Christ, but you don't have to be divided because of them. Okay? They were also divided because of the gifts. Because those who possess these more high-valued gifts tend to look down on those who possess the less-valued gifts in the church. So those who did not have this were somebody, somehow low, you know, low value to them. The VIPs are those who had these gifts. Do you understand this? Because these are highly valued by their culture. You understand where Paul is coming from, okay? And so he is saying here that the most important way to serve Christ, and we will see that as we get to chapter 12, is not these gifts, but your love for one another. It's not about your knowledge. It's not about your ability. It's about how you love people that you are measured by God. For if you do not have love, even if you possess all these supernatural abilities, Paul said, you are nothing. In God's eyes. You understand this? You see, in the end, we will not be judged by how much we know. Even how much we know about God and the mysteries of God. We will be judged on how we have lived. You understand this? Our conduct, our character is more important to God than all the knowledge that we have. Because those knowledge that we have about God and the mysteries of God mentioned here are not beneficial if they don't change your life. Remember, we are saved by faith, but we will be judged on our works, not on your faith. Do you understand this? Okay? So Paul is saying, don't take pride in possessing the special abilities over those whom you believe are lesser abilities because in the eyes of God, what matters most is how you love one another. 
That is how God measures us. Amen? And so that is what he's trying to say. So he's bringing this about. He talks about the gifts of the Spirit in chapter 12. Then talks about because this is the best way that you serve Christ. Okay? And then he goes in after explaining what love is. And we will not go to that. He continues. Can we read this together? Love never fails. Amen? Because the gifts will pass away. But love endures forever. And he's going to repeat that at the end here. Okay? Love never fails. You can read, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. When there are tongues, they will be silenced. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know only in part in this life. Okay? And we prophesy in part because we can only know about, you know, the thoughts of God and, and the things that God wants us to know partly only in this life. But when perfection, or literally the perfect, that's the English Standard Version translation, but when perfection, or in the new NIV, when completion comes, or when the perfect comes, the imperfect disappears, or fades away. When I was a child, I talked like a child, and I thought like a child, and reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me, saying, you see, it's like when you were children, you know, you, think, you thought you know it all. You know, you know, your knowledge when you're a child is just, you know, limited. But as you grow up, you have more maturity, you're able to know more. That's the idea of what Paul is saying here. So, you know, you put, you know, mga batang sa mayroon mag ibang debate. Tama? Pabidahan. Sana wag na po na makita sa atin, nagbibidahan tayo sa karunungan natin. Kasi childish things yan. Okay? So, I put childish ways behind me. Now we see, now it's talking about, this is knowledge, this is about the gift of knowledge, this is talking about the gift of prophecy, because prophecy are those who see the future. They are seers. Now we see only a poor reflection of the realities of God. You know why? Because in the time of Paul, their mirror is not as clear as our mirrors today. The mirrors in the time of Paul were made of bronze, polished bronze. And polished bronze is not as clear as our glass mirrors today, where every detail can be seen. Even the smallest, uh, you know, uh, defect in your, in your face can be seen, no matter how small, but not with the bronze mirrors, because they're just polished bronze. So they are not as clear as the person is looking into the mirror. That's what Paul is saying. You see, we see only a poor reflection in our mirrors. But one day, we shall see face to face because we will be with Him forever. We will see face to face. That means we will know as God wants us to know. And He said in the end, Now I know in part, then I shall know fully. Can we say know fully? Just as I am fully known. That's perfect knowledge. Is that possible in this life? Is the most important question. You understand this? Okay. And let's continue on. And now these three remain faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of this is love. Why? Because faith and hope will fade, just like the gifts. You see, you say you have faith because faith is the conviction of things unseen and the assurance of things hoped for. But when you see, it's no longer faith. When you possess what you hope for, it's no longer faith. But faith is when you're still waiting for it. You have the assurance it will be yours. You don't see God, but you believe in God. Faith means the conviction of things unseen. But when you see it, as Paul says, it's no longer faith. Hope is looking forward to something you long for. But when you already have it, there's no more need for hope. But love will always be practiced forever, even in the next life. Only love endures forever. In other words, because of the analogy of Paul between faith and love and the gifts, can you ask yourself why suddenly he thought about faith and love? He's talking about the gifts here. What's the connection? It's because he's trying to contrast the virtues of faith and love with the gifts because the gifts are temporary. It will end only in this life, just like faith and hope terminates only in this world, but only love endures forever. And that means all the gifts as not, are not as important in the end to God because they will pass just like faith and hope. Only love endures forever. Amen? Only love continues on. You understand this? 
Now follow the thread of thought of Paul. We go on now to chapter 12. So you see the bigger context. Let's take a look at the word perfect first. First Corinthians 13, 10, the perfect. This Greek phrase, totally all, happen, occurs only once in the New Testament. Here in First Corinthians 13, 10. Something like that appears in Romans 12, chapter 1, that you may know the will of God that is uh, acceptable and perfect. It does have the article the, but in the earlier part of the verse, not connected or attached to the verse, to the word itself, teleon. So teleon in the Greek is the word used, and it is in the neuter gender. Many times when the word teleon is used for people, it's always masculine. But here's not referring to anybody. It's referring to something, an object. And therefore, it is, the word is used, totally on neuter is used instead of masculine. Sometimes the feminine is used when it's talking about certain concepts like wisdom, perfect wisdom. The, because wisdom in Greek, Sophia, is feminine. Therefore, perfect has to be feminine. But only once, here in Romans 12.1, do we find the word perfect tell it on in the neuter gender? Only once. You understand this? And this is very significant because the word there carries the, the word da and perfect in the Greek. Totally on. Perfect, the word tell it on can mean perfect, mature, finish. It could mean in its noun form, completeness or perfection, or in short, that which is perfect or complete. You got this? Now, Cessationism believes that the word perfect here means mature. And it's talking about, they said, the maturity of the church. So when the church matures, these gifts will pass away. Which one? Those listed by Paul. Tongues, prophecy, and knowledge. But they add also healings and miracles, which Paul does not list. So, pang iba na wala sa listahan. You got this? Okay? So they believe that the word perfect here means when the church becomes mature. But the problem is, it's in the neuter gender. It's pointing to a concept. Okay? And it's talking about the idea of perfection versus imperfection. We know in part, we see in part. That's imperfection. The opposite of that is perfection. Or teleon. You got this? Which means that the idea of the perfect is not referring to the church. It is referring to the, 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 the gifts of God behind the gifts of the Spirit. The gift of knowledge, very most, most important, is behind those gifts. In other words, the perfect is referring to the gifts, not to the church. Because if it's for the church, it, would have been, it will not be in the neuter gender because ecclesia is feminine in Greek. It has to be in the feminine gender. But it's... Neuter is talking about a concept. And the idea is that all these gifts of the Spirit are just imperfection reflections of what is the perfect knowledge that will come in the end. You got this? So, does perfect refer to the church in the context of Paul? No, it's referring to the gifts of the Spirit. Okay? Now listen to this. The most reputable New Testament Greek lexicons, we call the scholarly dictionaries, indicate that when the definite article precedes the word as a noun, here perfect is a noun or a substantive, in the neuter gender, that is the perfect or the perfection, as in 1 Corinthians 13, 10, the only one in the New Testament, nothing like this. It points to an eschatological or end times event that is referring to the second coming of Christ. The phrase occurs only once in the entire New Testament. You understand this? It is a unique use of Paul because it's not talking about the church. It's talking about the gifts and the knowledge behind the gifts. That later on, that knowledge will be perfect. Not in this life, but in the eschaton, at the end of time, referring to the second coming of Christ. This is a grammatical use of teotelion. Do you understand this? Okay? So you don't have to master Greek here, but understand the context of Paul. Let's take a look now at 1 Corinthians 12. So this is how, uh, sorry, I'm getting to chapter 14 right now because I want us to follow the thread of thought of Paul, right? So he was talking about the value of love and he just ended with saying, love, the greatest of this is love because only love endures forever. It is only love that never fails. Faith and hope, like the gifts, will have a termination of the coming of Christ because that is when we possess full knowledge because in this life we cannot have that full knowledge. 
because limited by our fallen human nature. Do you understand this? Okay. And so he says, now follow the way of Namas. That is your priority. Not taking pride in your abilities. You don't measure your worth based on your ability. God measures you based on how you love one another. Amen? And I say to the person beside you, loving you is more important than all my abilities in the eyes of God. So that's why do not take too much pride in your God-given talents because those talents are given to you to serve others in love. Can we say that together? Abilities and talents are given by God so that you can serve others out of love. So God doesn't give you talents and abilities for you to base your identity on, ay, ang galing ko. Remember, God is opposed to the proud and He will bring you down one day and He will humble you, but He gives grace to the humble. You understand this? Okay? So not ability, but your capacity to love those who are offensive like you. That is Christ-like love. Do you understand this? Okay? I wish we can talk more about that, but see, continue on. And eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. Can you see, see that? Especially so does Paul consider the gift of prophecy as one really prominent gift? Especially. Can we say especially? So special ba yan? Desire, the spirit gets especially the gift of prophecy. He's saying this if you look at the context in contrast to tongues. He's saying especially the prophecy, hindi tongues. And he will explain why. Why not tongues? Why prophecy? Because you Corinthians are taking pride in superiority of giftings. You're taking pride in high value gifts. Remember this, if I'm to compare between tongues and prophecy, prophecy is more helpful. And he will explain why. This says, for anyone who speaks in the tongue does not speak to men but God because nobody understands you. You're speaking in another language that is not known to your listeners. Indeed, no one understands him. He utters mysteries with the spirits. Eh, kayo na lang ng Diyos. Tumahimik ka na lang. Kasi nakaistorbo ka sa iba. Hindi ka naintindihan. Hindi ka nakaka-edify. And then he says, But everyone who prophesies speaks to men for their strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. That's what I said. I mean, if you're to choose between the two, choose this. So you can build up the church. You got this? Okay? He who speaks in the tongue edifies himself kasi siya lang nabibless doon. But he who prophesies edifies the church. So it is with you, since you are eager to have spiritual gifts, try to excel in the gifts that build up the church, especially what gift, according to Paul. Therefore, my brothers, be eager to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues. I'm saying, I'm not saying that you have to kick out speaking in tongues. No, that is also important. But to compare the two in terms of usefulness to the body of Christ, prophecy is more beneficial. Now let me tell you this. If the gift of prophecy in 1 Corinthians 13 is one of those gifts listed, and it's said to be, it will cease. And if that cease, supposedly, when the New Testament books were formalized or canonized in the 4th century, then it means it's no longer needed, right? That's the implication. Why would Paul say, be eager to prophesy if it's not that important to the body of Christ? You understand this? Okay? Now we're not done yet. This is just part of finding or tracing the mind of Paul. So let's go to chapter 12. This is where all it started. Can we read this together? For To each one. Can we say each one? Who are the each one? Can you raise your hands? Are you sure? You're one of them. Okay, you're sure. To each one, the manifestation of the Spirit. you know what manifestation is? It means that something hidden is now made public. Something unknown is now made known. You cannot see the Holy Spirit, right? Anyone who has seen the Holy Spirit? Well, some said yes, because this person claims to be the Holy Spirit. Anyone who has seen the Holy Spirit? So how do you know that the Holy Spirit is at work? 
through the manifestation. The gifts of the Spirit given to each one of you manifest the power and the presence of the Spirit through you in the church. That's why many of us do not experience almost the power of God because you're not exercising your gifts. Jesus is disappointed because he gave you that gift for a reason. He was, you know, all these gifts of the Spirit were all manifest in the ministry of Christ. All of them. Look at all of them and ask yourself, when did Christ manifest this? You'll find instances in the Gospels. But there are only two gifts he never manifested. Can you guess what are they? This is a review. What gifts were never manifest in the ministry of Christ in this list? Tongues and interpretation of tongues. Why? Because Jesus did not need God gift. He was because he only ministered to the local people of Israel, never to foreigners. He did not need a gift. But you ask the question, why is it when the Holy Spirit was poured out on Pentecost on the people of God, the believers, the primary manifestation of the Spirit was the gift of tongues? Because it was foreshadowing the completion of the Great Commission when people from every time, language, and nation will declare that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. It was already foreshadowing the fulfillment of the mission of the church. That's why when they started speaking different languages, all the Jews who came from many nations, these are Hellenistic Jews who grew up in foreign countries, went there for the Feast of Pentecost. They said, we hear each of them speaking the praises of God in our own native tongue. Because in Revelation chapter 7, John saw a vision of countless multitudes from every language, people, and nation singing praises to the Lamb, holding palm branches in their hand. That is the fulfillment of that sign that God gave. You understand this? Jesus did not need it because he was only preaching his, on, in his native language all the time when he was on earth. Do you understand this? Okay. Now, he's saying to one there is the, through the message the, one there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom, the ability to you know, express wisdom or speak wisdom in any given situation that others find very difficult to address. How many of you have heard of people when they speak grabby on wisdom? That's the message of wisdom. Jesus manifested that, remember? Shall you pay taxes to Caesar or not? Because if he said yes, the Jews will get angry with him because he's collaborating with the occupying power. If he said no, the Romans will arrest him. You're teaching people to rebel against Rome. But I. So whatever his response is, somebody will get upset. And so did Jesus respond? Show me a denarius. Whose image and inscription is this? Caesar's. Render therefore to Caesar's the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God. Wow, what wisdom. That's the message of wisdom. Do you understand this? To other, the message of knowledge, the ability to take part of God's omniscience allow you to know things you can never know in your own way, on your own efforts, but not as comes to you as a part of the omniscience of God, whether regarding the future, people in front of you, even what they're thinking will be made known to you. The Bible said that Jesus made that say, Jesus knowing what they were thinking, that's knowledge. Word of knowledge. He knows exactly that you know, Nathaniel was under a fig tree before he came to him. That's knowledge. You understand this? He spoke something that showed knowledge. It's a small part of omniscience. Now listen carefully. By the means of the same spirit, to another faith, did Jesus have all the faith to steal the waters of the Sea of Galilee? Oh yeah, the faith. Peace be still. And of course, faith and miracles and healing are all connected. That's why after faith, you have healing and miracles because they're connected. And we find gifts of healing. Did Jesus do this? Oh, this was his major ministry. Second only to the preaching of the word. Miraculous powers. Right? Another prophecy. Did he talk about the future? Yes. This was able to discern spirits that the disciples did not see? Yes. Can see spirits. Speak 
Dati din nandu. In Romans 12, the other gifts, encouragement, was Jesus gifted with encouragement. Leadership was gifted with uh, gifted in leadership. Teaching was a gifted teaching. That was his life. He was teaching all the time. At such anointing that the teaching is changing hearts. Mercy, the additional mercy. Service. I came not to be served, but to serve. Yeah, the gift of service, right? What else we find there? Uh, I think I mentioned it all in chapter Romans 12. Jesus manifested all those gifts in one body. And so when Jesus went up to heaven, he had to pour out the Holy Spirit because the church was going to continue the mission he began. And for the church to fulfill his continuing mission in the world, to reach out and bring the lost back to his kingdom, he had to endow us with the same gifts that he operated with on earth so he can continue to exercise that ministry through the church, through the gifts distributed to each one of you. And if you don't use this gift, you are depriving Jesus of his desire to minister to people through you. Do you understand this? You must be so blessed. To be chosen by Christ. To be his partner in doing his work. Not yours. That's not your work. That's his work. The same gifts he received was endowed to you. So he can continue working through you. That is why these gifts are so important to Christ. But what the Corinthian church were failing to understand, these gifts were not given for you to boast about them. These gifts were given to you so Jesus can serve people through you out of love. Amen? So the gifts are given for the ministry of loving people and serving people. It's not about you. It's about Jesus operating through that gift to touch that brother and sister around you. That's Jesus working through you. Through that gift. Now you understand why these gifts are so precious to Christ. Do you know your spiritual gifts? We already did this survey. I hope you filled up the survey form. I'm sad that not all of you really did it. And I'm not always sad. Jesus is sad because you're not interested to know how he wants to work for you, through you and with you. He wants that. It's not for you to choose whether you will serve Christ. He already chose that for you. But how you're going to serve Him will depend on the gift that was given you because that is what He chose, how you will serve Him. And that's how you will glorify Him in your life. Amen? So do you know your spiritual gifts? How many of you know your spiritual gifts? Okay? Saves that all. Can we redo the survey again? <laughs> Number two, how many of you who know your spiritual gifts are faithfully exercising them for service to others. Okay. Jesus is looking to you to help him finish the work that he is doing in this world. Amen? You understand this? You cannot take this for granted. So all of these are the work of one and the same Spirit because the Holy Spirit empowers you to carry out your assignment from Christ. It is Jesus who decides what will be your ministry, how you will serve Him. The Holy Spirit now equips you with the gifts you need so you can serve Him the way Jesus wants you. That's why there is a, a, a work thing together between Jesus and the Holy Spirit. You understand that? It's not the Holy Spirit who decides. He decides only based on Jesus' assignment for you where He wants you to serve Him. Okay? So let's continue on. Now, continue in chapter 12. Now he just talks about the gifts of the Spirit. The problem is that this church was being torn apart because of those gifts. No, not because of those gifts. Because of their wrong attitude about the gifts. Are you still there? So let's continue. Now the body is not made up of one part of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body. I'm just poor me. I'm not as significant as you guys. Well, prophecy and tongues and all those things. Okay? It would not for that reason cease to be still part of the body. Right? You may have the gift of service and giving, but I tell you, without those two services or two gifts in the church, this church won't last long financially. 
Right? Hindi lahat mahilig mag-serve, tama? Mag-walis after the service this morning, you know, mag-ayos sa mga silya. Hindi lahat may ganong heart. May mga pag-gifted ka sa gift of service like Jesus, you find delight in doing those things. Hindi ka napilitan, gusto mo. Kasi yun ang gift mo eh. It's Jesus in you, serving through you. Serving your brothers and sisters. Do you understand this? Okay? So, he said, if the ear should say, because I'm not an I, ito siguro yung, ito inisip ni Pablo, ito yung mga prophets, kasi sila nakakarinig sa Jesus, no? If you were an ear, because I'm not an I, I don't belong to the body, masikat yung mata. Okay? If it would not for that reason cease to be part, it's still part of the body. You have a role to play. Okay? If the whole body were an eye, imagine, can you see uh, a person, a human being, na mata lang? <laughs> a monster. <laughs> oh, okay. If you're an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But, now listen to this. this. Can we read this together? But, in fact, God has arranged parts the body, every one of them, just as He wanted them to be. It is not for you to decide. Amen? Jesus decides what your ministry will be. You don't decide that on your own. It will depend on the gifts that were given to you by the Holy Spirit. Do you understand? Now listen to what Paul is saying. It is God who decides how you will serve Him and God has arranged all the gifts for all believers is as a way to carry out His purpose in the church and in the world. He arranged it that way because that's what He wanted. Do you understand this? In other words, what Paul is saying all the gifts are equally important. They may be VIP to you or not. All, even the lesser gifts in your eyes, in your valuation, are all equally important. There is no gift that is less important because it doesn't look like the high value abilities to the Greeks. Do you understand this? Anything. All the gifts are equally important. We go on. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. The head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you because I am already a superstar. I have them. The high-valued gifts. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable because kung wala kang paapa, paano lalakad yung body? Diba? Puro mata lang. Walang pa. Okay? And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat them with special honor. Kasi without them, kung wala mga gift of service dito, makakaproblema tayo sa may-ari ng, ano, ng restaurant. Kasi wala maglilinis. Wala magkaayos ng mga chairs. Wala magdadala ng equipment. Maglalabas ng equipment. Kasi hindi nila heart you. You got this? Okay? And the parts that are unpresentable, at least in the eye of the Greeks, because they have their own high-value abilities, are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment because sikat na sila eh. Right? They're looked up by the people because they are the, you know, the high-value gifts. But God has combined the members of the body and has given greater honor to the parts that lacked it so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other because what is Paul saying? All the gifts are equally important to the body and to God. Can I say that together? All the gifts are equally important to God. So here comes the question. Why would some people say some of the gifts will have to go in time while the others will continue? If all the gifts according to chapter 12 in the eye of Paul are all equally important, why would say some gifts have to go? That means they are not as important as the other gifts. They are not as useful as the other gifts. You understand what, what, what we are seeing here in Paul? And so he continues on. Now you are the body of Christ, and each of you is a part of it. And in the church, God has appointed, first of all, apostles. You see, even though the gifts are all equally important, Paul is saying, but there is a hierarchy. There is a hierarchy. I have to give honor first to the apostles. Because they were the ones whom the Lord used to start the church. Their teachings are the foundation of the church. We are built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. You got this? And so you have to give honor to them. And you have to obey them. You understand that? So first of all, apostles, because they are the foundation. Second, prophets. Now, if prophets are important in the church, why should they stop their ministry? They are second in rank. Okay? Third, teachers. Then workers of miracles. Oh, miracles are important in the hierarchy. 
gifts of healing, those who help others, the gift of service, those who gifts of administration, those speaking in different kinds of tongues, last in the list. <laughs> tongues. Okay? Because Paul is trying to de-emphasize that. Are all apostles expected answer? Are all prophets expected answer? Are all teachers expected answer? Do all work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all speak in tongues? Louder. Do all speak in tongues? Not all are given a gift. Is that clear? Okay. Do all interpret tongues? No. But eagerly desire the greater gifts. And then he moves into the most excellent thing, which is love, the next chapter. And then in chapter 14, he recapitulates from here. Eagerly desire the greater gifts. Chapter 14, verse 1. Eagerly desire the spiritual gifts, especially to prophesy. Notice the connection between the last verse of chapter 12 and the opening verse of chapter 14. Follow the way of love. Eagerly, earnestly desire spiritual gifts, especially to prophesy. This is where he starts over where he ended here. But he had to put a, you call that, he had to put an intermission first. From this to the beginning of chapter 14, because he's going to emphasize something that the Corinthian Christians have to understand. Love is more important than all the gifts. That's what you lack. You have no problem with the gifts. You have it all. But one thing you don't have is more important is loving one another. And he said, he introduces the chapter on love by saying, now I will show you the most excellent way of what? Of serving God. And what is that? Loving people. Loving people. Amen? I was about to say something, but I won't. I'm just saddened when I see people, bra you know, fight about knowledge and abilities. And they miss the whole point. You're supposed to love your brother. Amen? Now, notice here, prophecy was supposed to be the manifestation of the gift, of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit as prophesied by the prophet Joel. This was the prophecy of Joel, which in the Old Testament has two fulfillments, one in history and the other at the end of history or the eschatological fulfillment. One historical fulfillment, one eschatological fulfillment. And here, listen to this. The manifestation of the pouring of the Holy Spirit is prophecy, right? In the prophecy of Joel. But what actually happened in Acts chapter 2, the primary manifestation of the pouring of the Holy Spirit was not prophecy, it was tongues. You got this? Because God was doing something that is most significant at the time. Because it was foreshadowing that one day every tribe, nation, language shall praise and glorify God with one voice. You understand this? Now listen. But look, how long will the gift of prophecy last? Because that is what is emphasized in the prophecy of Joel. He said, even on my servant, both men and women, I will pour my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. Which days? The days that look forward, verse 19 to 20, to the eschatological or the end time return of Christ. Now listen carefully. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs of the earth below, blood, fire, and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, name of the Lord will be saved. So what is... Joel saying, how long will the prophetic ministry operate on earth? Until when? Until it brings us to the glorious return of Christ. Do you understand this? Okay. Here's another one. Paul said to the Corinthians, you know, the Corinthians has enough context to help us understand that when the perfect comes, it refers to what happens to the second coming of Christ. Not when the church comes to maturity because even today the churches the church is still not mature enough you got this in terms of character in terms of knowledge we have the canon but that is not the meaning of paul because he was not thinking about the canon in the fourth century when he wrote those words he was talking about the perfection of the knowledge that the gifts bring to us 
Not about the perfection of the church, but the perfection of the gifts. Okay, so let's go on. So can we read this together? I always thank God for you because of His grace given to you in Christ Jesus. For in Him you have been enriched in every way. How? Through the gifts. In all your speaking and in all your knowledge, because again, these are the two most highly valued abilities by the Greeks. And God said, He gave you all, everything you really valued. Speaking abilities, knowledge abilities, it's all yours. Okay? Because of our testimony about Christ was confirming you. It has what confirmed that you indeed received the gospel are the gifts of the Spirit that you are now exercising. They confirm the testimony of Christ, which is the gospel, that truly you have received the gospel, and what confirms it in you are the gifts of the Spirit. You understand? And listen, Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift because you have been confirmed already as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be able. In other words, the gifts will confirm you until Jesus comes. They serve as your confirmation that you are truly have received the gospel, that you have the Holy Spirit. The gifts you are operating with will confirm you until Jesus is revealed. So according to Paul, how long shall the gifts last? Until Jesus comes. Okay? Hebrews 2.13. Again, this is relating to what Paul just said a while ago. Can we read this together? How shall we escape if we ignore such great salvation? This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord when he was preaching on earth, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. How? God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles, and gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. The gifts confirm your salvation until Jesus comes. You understand this? So let me ask you, as we follow the thread of thought of Paul from chapter 12, 13, and 14, in his understanding, until when will all the gifts operate? Until Jesus returns. That's when perfection of knowledge comes. At Jesus coming. No longer dimly or partly. We will know as we are fully known. That can never happen in this life but only when we are freed from this mortal body and we are now joined with Christ at the resurrection and we will know. That's why the prophecy in Jeremiah the Covenant, they will no longer say, Know the Lord, for each one of them shall know me. For as the, as the waters cover the sea, so the knowledge of the Lord will fill the earth at that time. The knowledge of the Lord will fill the whole earth at that time. As the waters over the sea. Amen? So, perfect here is not referring to the church maturity. Because how can Paul think of that? Because his writings were still to be canonized. I mean, it's already so that in the 4th century all of this will be put together and that makes the church mature. There have been debates of doctrine even beyond the 4th century. Heresies broke in the church in every generation. How can we say the church has matured because the canon was finished? You understand this? And finally, the cessationist view argues primarily from experience. They're saying that the this is because history shows they disappeared. That's what they think. Okay, listen to this. Rather than the scriptures for evidences of the cessation of certain gifts, especially the miraculous ones, miracles healing from that, because they said these things disappeared in history. Is it true? But history is witness to the continuance of the manifestation of those gifts, even beyond the first century, right into the Middle Ages, the Reformation into modern times, and were suppressed only at certain points in history because of the fear of the heretical. Because the gift of prophecy especially has been abused from the time of the New Testament church itself. Fear of heresy caused them to shut down on the gift of prophecy especially in knowledge. Do you understand this? Let's continue on. The fact is, can we read this together? History reveals that the gifts of prophecy and tongues partly disappeared from the church, not because God willed these gifts to cease, but because it was quenched in the church by the religious leadership due to the fear and threat of heresy. But these particular gifts would sporadically appear at different points in history of the church, a testimony to the fact that they have not in any way ceased by the will of God, but simply suppressed by the will of man. Okay, let's go on. 
Even in the New Testament church, the first century, the gifts are already being abused. Especially the gift of tongues and prophecy, you can read those scriptures and see how these gifts were being abused in the apostolic church. This soon led to the avoidance of their use in the church. That's why Paul warns them not to despise prophesying. First Thessalonians 5 tells us that people were already trying to stop prophetic utterances. They were already quenching the spirit. They were trying to stop it because there were abuses. You got this? You understand where Paul is coming from? But he says, do not despise prophesyings. They are important to the church. And thereby quench the spirit. In the, you're, you're quenching this. Do not quench the spirit. But to test everything here. That's the key. Don't quench. Test. Okay? Paul in these two passages just cited emphasizes that the correct response to abuse is not non-use. Abolition, but rather right use or regulation. That's why 1 Corinthians 14, Paul laid down very clear specific regulations on the prophetic gift because he knows it will be abused. So we don't stop using it because it is equally important like the all other gifts. And Paul says that prophecies edifies the church. Why quench it? Why would God stop something that Paul considers very important to the church? Do you understand this? Okay. And so he says, regulate it. Be sure that people follow my instructions on the gift of prophecy. Okay? Can we read this together? The early church theologian Tertullian, AD 160-20, was associated with the Montanist movement, a movement that were manifesting the gifts of the Spirit, but ultimately led into heresy. They became cultic. Naging kulto po sila. But Tertullian was part of them. But he was the one who began to discern the extremes of the Montanist movement and supported the validity of the two gifts because he himself manifested the gifts. Now listen, earlier Irenaeus, 115-202 AD, the early church historian theologian and Justin Martyr, 8100-165, another theologian in the early church testified to the continuing presence of prophecy and miracles in the post-apostolic church that means after the first century. Irenaeus was a disciple of Polycarp. Polycarp was a disciple of John the Apostle himself. John the Apostle mentored Polycarp. He became bishop of Ephesus. Okay? Irenaeus was the disciple of Polycarp. That was, you see, this is in the first century. Who was in turn the disciple of John the Apostle, died in 98 AD. Polycarp himself experienced a prophetic vision that foretold his martyrdom by fire. Origen, AD 180, that's already second to the third century, professes to have been an eyewitness of many instances of exorcism, healing, and prophecy, although he refuses to record details lest he should rouse the laughter of the unbeliever. But they were manifest. Let's continue on. The, monta the monastic movement, that is mga, those who go to the mountains you know, to uh, segregate themselves from the civilization so they can live holy lives without the sinful influence of cities, okay? The monastic movement, the monks, experienced a revival of the prophetic, especially dreams and visions, along with miracles of healing and deliverance, like Francis of Assisi. Not all of the claims manifested were authentic. Some of them were actually false. Okay? But many were soon recognized, though tolerated by the Catholic Church. Catholic theology tends to reject any divine revelation outside the church because the church is the reservoir of divine revelation. No revelation outside the church. And of course, prophecy is revelation outside the church. Correct? They tend to reject any divine revelation outside the church, which holds itself to be the only infallible guide for all truth. Through the church's history, some of those manifesting the gifts were charged with witchcraft or demonization and were executed, like Joan of Arc. Joan of Arc was condemned and burned, at the, uh, burned alive by one pope. Another pope declared her a saint. So which one of them is right? The one who condemned her as a witch because of her prophetic visions? Or the pope who said he's now a saint? She's now a saint. They're confused. Okay? The Reformation movement, because of its spirit conflict with the centrality of the authority of the Holy Scriptures, because the Reformers emphasized sola scriptura. Because of that emphasis, because they were reacting to the abuse of the church, of its traditions, that created so many teachings never found in the Scriptures. Let's go back to the Scriptures. The Protestant movement, the Reform movement was back to the Bible. You got that? Because of the spirit conflict with the centrality of the authority of the Holy Scriptures and preconditioned by the contemporary influence of humanistic uh, rationalism, which rejected anything mystical, 
the manifestations of the gifts of tongues and prophecy were soon rejected by the reform movement until today. That's history. You got this? Because the final authority is the Holy Scriptures. That's correct. But you don't deny the manifestations of the Spirit if they are proven to be genuine. And that prophecy, any prophecy that goes against the Holy Scriptures cannot be accepted. Because the final basis of truth is always sola scriptura. And all prophecies, prophetic utterances must be validated by sola scriptura. You got this? That's how you regulate the prophetic. And because rationalism was the time of the day, that's why Luther said, unless convinced by the scriptures and by reason, I will not recant. In the Diet of Worms, that's Luther, uh, Martin Luther. Why? Because rationalism was the dominant philosophy of his time. And because rationalists denied the existence of the mystical, the reformers, influenced by that philosophy from the world, rejected all these prophetic tongues saying that sound and look mystical. That's the reason why. Okay? Let's go on. Earlier, however, according to the testimony of the Scottish writer Samuel Rutherford, this is 17th century, John Haas, that's 15th century, and Wycliffe, John Wycliffe, one who gave the first English translation of the Bible, 14th century, and Martin Luther, 16th century, received prophetic revelation. These men, according to Rutherford, based on research, received revelation prophetically and have foretold things to come and they certainly fell out, they actually took place. You're talking about these men. All receive prophetic revelations. Rutherford furthermore cites other examples of men who have exercised prophetic gifts with amazing accuracy, such as Scottish reformers George Wishart, 16th century, Presbyterian founder John Knox, and e. Io Davidson, as well as diverse holy and mortified, the Matina, martyr, English preachers, Scottish Minister Alexander Peden, 17th century, exercised the prophetic gift in such a powerful way that it guided him away from his persecutors and enabled him to oversee subsequent events in his life with amazing accuracy. This is now 17th century. Okay, and going on. Now, you know Charles Spurgeon, right? Charles Spurgeon is Baptist. Most Baptists are cessationists. Now listen carefully. The revival era from the 18th to the 19th century. The great spiritual revivals that took place in the centuries saw the popular manifestations of the Tugis, tongues and prophecy. English theologian and Methodist founder John Wesley himself and Baptist preacher Charles Haddon Spurgeon, who was thought to have been a cessationist, are among some of the prominent figures in the spirit who either exercised or endorsed the gift of prophecy in tongues. Charles Spurgeon even gave a sermon and wrote an article about his experience of prophetic revelation. There was at one point that he was preaching suddenly he stopped. You young men, you have been taking things without paying for them. You better repent and pay for those things. Shock. And it's true. How did Spurgeon know that? Prophetic revelation. This is a Baptist who was thought to be a cessationist. You understand this? That is why we end with this. The warning of Paul, do not quench the spirit. How? Do not despise prophecies. But test everything. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil because these gifts can be abused for personal gain. And you know that. Amen? So what are we learning? Do the gifts continue until today? Yes. Until the second coming of Christ. Because they confirm the testimony of Christ in the church. Why? Because Jesus manifested all of these gifts in his earthly life. And because we are followers of Christ and we receive the testimony of Christ, all those gifts are also manifest in the church as the confirmation that you belong to Christ. All the gifts. And they are all equally important according to Paul. Especially the gift of prophecy. Shall we bow in prayer? Father in heaven, I thank you that you did not leave us with a clear witness of your word to understand your ways and your will. 
We thank you, Lord, that so many years of study have made people to realize that we must not read our own meaning into the text, but rather let the text speak for itself. I pray, Father, that you'll give us the heart that we'll be careful when we study the scriptures, not to read experiences into the text, but rather to allow the text to affect our experience instead by carefully studying the original intention of the text based on the writer's thread of thinking throughout his writings. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, that you have blessed us with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And thank you, Lord, you hold us, give us the privilege to serve you and to allow you, Lord, to minister through us afresh. As we exercise our gifts, we allow you to continue your work of serving people and touching lives. Father, I pray for each member of this community that they will so hunger to know their gifts and to faithfully exercise them, Lord, for the benefit of the body, so that you continue to manifest your power and your presence among us as these gifts are the manifestations of the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit among us. Thank you so much, Father. We will obey and we will serve you according to the gifts that you have given us because we love you and we love our brothers and sisters. This is our commitment today. And as we keep our heads bowed, I want to see if you are said that prayer with me that, Lord, I commit to allow you to minister to the world through me, through the gifts that you have given me, which was also yours when you were here on earth. Lord, use me. I will serve you. I will discover my gifts. I will build on those gifts and faithfully exercise them because this is how you have chosen me to serve you. If you had a commitment, can you raise your hands right now? Are you committing yourself to be the Lord's channel of blessing through those gifts? Find what those gifts are if you don't know them. And when you do, never stop exercising them so Jesus can work through you and touch lives through you. For His glory and for His kingdom, in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Let's give uh, another praise of clap offering to the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Dave, for that such inspiring message and it gives us a deeper understanding about the gifts that the Lord has given us. It's perfect. And it's coming time of perfection. And the love 